when the Bonero Policy Group supported the U.S. government position of FinCEN on treating cryptocurrencies as if they were fungible assets, same as cash or gold or something like that, which is really what they are, uh, we, we were one of the few, and they're not the only, that we actually were in, in direct opposition to most members of the blockchain communities. Mm. Because most people supported these companies. That's the problem. And they were sold. I mean, you would, they, they, what the government was asking for, you know, five years ago, they were asking for travel rules. They were asking for the same rules that applied to cash. That's what they were asking for. But they're a combination of these blockchain surveillance companies that had money to make, and a lot of members within the Bitcoin community said, no, 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 you can use this instead. And in fact, what we have is both. Right. So, so they, they created a monster, which is now a real problem, or uh, well, the only thing you have to do is throw Monero under the bus. You can't list Monero. This week on Monero Talk is sponsored by Cake Wallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero and Bitcoin safely on iOS and Android too. Cake Wallet is open source and you always control your own keys. And by Stealth EX, an instant exchange where privacy is the top concern. Go to stealthex.io to instantly exchange between Monero and 450 plus assets without having to create an account or register and with no limits. Making Stealth EX a simple way to purchase Monero with crypto anonymously. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you. And supporting us is easier than ever. By typing in monerotalk.crypto in your monero.com or cake wallet send address field to send us a tip. This week on Monero Talk. Douglas Tuman interviews Francisco Cabañas, a.k.a. Arctic Mine, a member of the Monero core team. The two discuss Bitcoin's fungibility and traceability. Does blockchain surveillance actually work? The MICA regulation in the EU and its consequences for Monero and other privacy coins. Monero's growing usage in the darknet markets and the possibility of this seeping into the clear net. They cover the SEC labeling some cryptocurrencies as securities and much more. Monero Talk starts now. All right. Arctic, what's going on, man? Well, I'm getting ready for a series of trips. I'm flying out tomorrow to New York. And then from New York, I'm going to be going to Madrid. And then I'm going to be going to Prague. Nice. You're stopping in Madrid first. That, that's yes. Best. Yes. I basically, uh, well, the reason I'm going to New York, of course, is I'm an expert witness in uh, the legal case. <laughs> is, so, is that, oh, is that happening? Is that happening during your visit? You're going to be testifying? No. Uh, one of the hearings, yes. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So basically, uh, I, I, we kind of scheduled everything. <laughs> So we're still working on the, on the details of that, but uh, yeah, because well, they present they presented at Monerotopia. I assume you're there's that initial hearing that they need to do, right? What is it? The term? What's the, it's uh, I forget the the legal term. It's it's I think it's called Dalpit. Like yeah, that. what is that basically determining? It's whether or not you can um, you 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 can enter expert certain uh, expert testimony. Mm. Which in this case may be quite, quite. A, it's actually very important. Yeah, because this is. Well, can, can we just back up just to give the viewers? I know you can't go into too much, just so they they know what we're talking about. Though we're talking about the Bitcoin fog case. Yes, but I really can't get into a lot of uh, specific details yeah. on it. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, I, well, we could just talk about just a few things that we're talking that they've already presented publicly, right? So this is the Bitcoin yeah, fog case. Yeah, you can say this, that. Yeah, this. Um, Initial hearing is about, like you said, whether certain evidence can be entered into that, into the trial, and the, and I guess what's of particular interest is whether or not evidence regarding that the traceability of Bitcoin using chain analysis can be, can be essentially part of the. That's one of the right. questions, but that's not the entire picture. So, okay. so, I right. think it's a bit hard to go into the details of this at this point. Okay. Uh, I just well, leave it at uh, that and. Okay. We well, will have ample um, opportunity to discuss it afterwards. Yes, super, super cool that you that you linked up with them at Monerotopia. Uh, 
I'm proud. I'm proud of that. That 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 came out of that. That's that's very cool that that happened. That's really good. But it's it's to be expected. I mean, that's a very successful event, and quite honestly, that's what these things do. I mean, you you get minds to meet on different things, and I'm sure that's not the only one. Yeah, for anybody who's listening is kind of confused what we're talking about. You could go back and watch. I we I interviewed the guys, uh, Tor, uh, was it Erkland? Eklund? Erkland, yes. Erkland. Yeah, I interviewed them on the show about the Bitcoin fog case. They're the attorneys uh, that are mm-hmm. representing the defendant. And then they also spoke at Monerotopia, and that video mm-hmm. will be going up soon. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, let's let's actually riff off of that. I know you can't talk about the case, but let's talk about kind of the, the implications there, right? And the, what this is really all about right not the specifics of the case but just this idea of bitcoin being traceable and because of its traceability uh running into instances like this where it's being used in the court of law to to make determinations well it's a bit more than that i mean i take the point of view that it's not really traceable at all in yes fact, which is highly yes, erroneous which is what i want to get to that, that that's what i want <laughs> really i want to fully understand your current opinion of bitcoin with regards to its privacy and fungibility and the implications it's uh interesting and i and i and i kind of look at it maybe from the perspective of monero in a different way how do you define privacy when we want when you that's where a real world question mm-hmm. um because what are we trying to hide are we trying to hide the actual spend bury it in noise. I mean, if you think what Monero does, I mean, you have a confidential transaction, so it actually makes something, it's like encrypting it, it makes it hidden, and that would be the, the fee amount. We have a stealth address, which is a similar thing. But when you get to ring signatures, what you're doing is obfuscating. So you basically are creating six, one of six, 16 possible signers. Now, the problem, uh, the, the question we get into here, and this is why there's a whole spectrum, is if you say something is private, is that you can't determine who the signer is, for example, or be well, how, what, how many issues privacy. And in science, we call that the signal, like determining you know who the signer is. The problem here is that you have what would be considered technically systemic bias, which is way stronger than the signal which is what the artifacts are created by its blockchain surveillance companies. And, and then you try to obfuscate that. And, and to make a long story short, short, in many cases, if not in most cases, Bitcoin does a reasonably decent job of obfuscating the signal. It does not obfuscate the bias or the, or the systemic bias, mm-hmm. which can lead to false accusations. So. It's kind of like you've got two things that you're dealing with. You're dealing with with a signal, which is the actual measurement. And then you're dealing with this huge big thing, which is an artifact created by essentially a proprietary algorithm, which is way stronger and harder to hide or to obfuscate. So when someone says um, Monero's got better privacy than Bitcoin, of course it does. If your intention is just to hide the signal, you might get away with Bitcoin. And I think I, I have to agree with uh, maybe Seth, Seth of privacy's peaks come to his point of view. But if you want to protect people from false accusations, we more than likely will have to strengthen Monero. Because realistically, ultimately, even shorter, if you want to be if you want to be crazy enough and make wild accusations, pretty well you're gonna need what's called a full membership. Like any any any, any uh, um, output in the in the blockchain is a potential input for your for your transaction. So how much are you willing to believe marketing claims and FUD and lobbying behind the scenes and all this other stuff? And so it's not like it's a black or white situation. You, if you can say that the Bitcoin obviously does not protect from false accusations, we know that. The question is, it may actually protect from the actual signal. And then even some people are claiming that they can track Monero and make false accusations. Do you, so you got to make, sorry? Go ahead. Go ahead. And then I'll ask questions. So, 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 it's the, so I guess the point is, uh, I kind of think of it two ways. You know, if you look at, say, for example, an astronomer and they've got a really bright star and they're looking at this little object right next to it, maybe a planet or something. 
And that's their interesting signal. Well, Bitcoin might hide the planet, but which is what you're interested in. Mon you need Monero or even to strengthen Monero to bury the star in the noise that is blind, blinding out the, the, the planet. That's kind of the analogy. Okay. Okay. So do you, th would you define Bitcoin as being fungible? Well, that depends on how much how much you're willing to to accept these uh, proprietary algorithms, right? If you actually believe the marketing claims, then no, it's not fungible. If you are prepared to question them and not accept them, then there's a fair amount of fungibility. And the other problem you get into is, is, is ignoring your... like the reality, right? The reality, well, is, the reality is the chain analysis companies exist, and they're currently tracking and tracing transactions. Now, whether or not that's perfectly accurate is one thing or well, another. Right? You, know, you know it's not perfectly accurate, but they are able to use a tool to gain insight into transactions. No, I, I would disagree. In many cases, they're, they're, what they have is, 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 is a little more than guesswork. What they've done is a very good marketing job on, on uh, regulators and governments and exchanges. Hmm. So, so it's so not about. Saying, like, so, what I'm saying is, it's the stuff. Right, sort of, sorry, you're you're saying it doesn't chain analysis works to some degree. You agree, though, right? It's not. No, I don't. Uh, the more I look into it, the less I believe it actually works. Okay, okay. I want to. I want to uh, fully understand it. I'm. I'm well, I, you know, I think this is an this is an important topic, right? Because I. It know, is. A lot, yeah. a lot of us in Monero talk about how you know. Bitcoin, its fatal flaw is its traceability, right? And that argument relies on the fact that it can, in fact, be be tracked and traced. And you're pretty strongly saying no, that that's really not not the case at all. Not the, not in any reasonably reliable fashion. No, uh, in fact, and this I've been saying this for a long time. Yep. What you ha but the problem is, is the harm that you can do by is in many cases way worse than if you could properly trace it. Yeah, no, I think the harm, the harm, right, the fault, the false accusations that that can that can come from it. Um, so, how about surveillance? Do you think people can be mass surveilled because of Bitcoin? Or you're saying that you can't properly mass surveil? No, I don't think you, well, you can't mass surveil. But what you can do is think you're mass surveilling and accuse people in mass. Right. See, I, I, this, this is this is the, this is the... do that without Bitcoin, right? Like you can then just. Does Bitcoin? Does Bitcoin? Is it? Is it more uh, apt to mass surveillance than say physical cash? Uh, the whole world, we're using Bitcoin. It's more well. I, I guess you could do a similar thing with physical cash. For example, what you could do with physical cash is you could test each node for cocaine, and then assign a risk score. <clears throat> depending on the concentration of cocaine on each node, and if it hits a certain hidden proprietary threshold, throw people in jail. Well, yeah, but you, but you can't also surveil it for other purposes. Well, right? no, 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 but yeah, but, but this, this is the example. So, it, because it's actually quite analogous to what these people are doing. Um, you, would t you would go in here and say most U.S. currency is known to be contaminated with cocaine. Now, what you could do is you go ahead and say, well, we're going to analyze the notes. And depending if, the, if there's a certain concentration of cocaine, you f you're below a certain threshold, then you consider it innocent. But we're not going to tell you what the threshold is. That's proprietary information of this corporation. And if it's above the threshold, you're accused of being uh, a trafficker in cocaine. Mm -hmm. That would be a reasonable analogy. So what you have is a situation where and then somebody else comes out with uh, money made out of plastic or something like in Canada. Well, I don't know if that works with Canadian currency, which you can't contaminate with cocaine. But, but, but my point is, it's not that you're so you you uh, so you could do the same thing with physical cash if you wanted to. Now, in the case of physical cash, there is a legal fungibility in, in there. But the the distinction we have to make is: Are you really are you really surveilling? Or are you really basically pretending you're surveilling and selling essentially what in, may, in many cases is snake oil, where the, the, the person to whom the snake oil is, is, is sold happens to be governments and regulators? 
Yeah, I don't know. I I want I want to talk about this further, right? So it's a fascinating topic, you know, because this is really the issue. This is really the the absence. Here, the point is, is the absence of privacy mm-hmm. does not mean you have good surveillance. You can look at it that way. The two are not like privacy. Uh, you know, you could create the whole idea in the design of Bitcoin privacy, and there is an entire section on privacy in Bitcoin block uh, uh, white paper. Is you have anonymous output and you break the linkage between the output and the and a personal person mm-hmm. and so therefore you 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 frustrate it enough that it's practical this is the theory to actually surveil it someone comes along cooks up an algorithm keeps it proprietary throws in a bunch of heuristics and stuff in, in the system and guesses some of them are completely wild some of them are totally invalid and then turns around and says, we can detect criminal activity. And we're going to sell this to governments and we're going to charge them a big fee to access our proprietary software. They do a good enough sales job. They convince, convince enough regulators and enough um, uh, law enforcement officials, etc., that they got this too good to be true tool for law enforcement. They fall for it. They pay them a lot of money and they start accusing people. And all of a sudden, the whole thing gets dumped in front of the court. Well, the problem is that they might not have anything. Now, along comes Monero and makes it really, really obvious that you can't do it. But still, I mean, and most of these regulators and uh, government says, well, you can't really do it with Monero, but we'll try. We're going to put spend six hundred thousand dollars or whatever they offered to try to trace Monero, and, and one of these boxes, surveillance companies actually got this contract. And this is the IRS, and another one went ahead, and when we increased the, the ring signature from eleven to sixteen, they actually said this was uh, Cyphertrace, owned by Mastercard. They actually said it wouldn't impact their their tool. Hello, and what they say they have is a visualization tool. So you can see the transactions. So if you increase the number of, of, of potential signers from uh, 11 to 16, you're going to need a way to make a screen. That's just basic mathematics. But I don't know. We weren't impacted at all. So what are we talking about here? Are we talking about an actual signal, an actual surveillance that actually surveils and actually works? Or are we talking about what could be called a surveillance snake oil? That has been effectively sold to buy as a regular side. This is the problem. I don't know. I don't know if I'm totally buy, buying it. And yeah, I'm willing to be convinced. <laughs> you yeah, know, I, 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 I understand I understand that uh <laughs> you know it it could be snake oil to a degree, but we, we it's it's like what what can we compare it to that uh in current you know in, in current law and, and fighting crime, right? There's other tools that's been used in the past that Aren't perfectly aren't perfect determiners, but they're used, right? Because they mm. they, they they show uh, probabilistically that somebody may have done something, right? Isn't yeah, but pro- most of prob- criminal analysis like that. I mean, obviously uh, DNA is pretty pretty accurate. Uh, fingerprints, I don't I don't know. Are, are they? There's are they things on right? the margins that of a tool that generally works, but this is a case where it just doesn't work at all. Mm. And in any reliable fashion, and you don't you don't see it getting better. You see it getting worse. You don't see. Well, absolutely, it, it, it getting worse. And I'll tell you right now why. It's called the binomial theorem. And 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 in the binomial theorem, which is a, an interesting high school uh, math problem, so you got a set of n outputs of n objects, and you have and then you have a subset of k objects, and then you look at how many times can you shoot the k objects out of n objects. Well, that's uh, n factorial divided by k factorial times n minus k factorial. It's well known. So, so that's the, the 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 puzzle ways to do this. So, as you increase k, if k is a percentage of n, then this thing is a very is faster than an exponential. So it becomes less and less a, 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 a sharper and sharper. Uh, so it's less and less probable. So it completely doesn't scale at all. And essentially, you die in a sea of data. I kind of joke, but I would say that these companies uh, are going to drone in a sea of ether because ether is 12 terabytes or something before Monero kills them. Maybe Monero will kill them beforehand. Who knows? 
but but the fact of the matter is is that what we have here is a com is there is definitely a, a, a knowledge asymmetry. I think a lot of the law enforcement people don't really understand what exactly is being sold to them mathematically. And then you've got everything's hidden behind proprietary algorithms and so on. I mean, in, in some cases, I mean, the, the classic example, which is the one that I talked about, which they don't take into consideration, is the fact what happens if you transfer the private key off chain. Right. Well, well the simplest, that's, not, that's sorry? not too practical, though, right? Because yes, it is. Yeah, but yes, it is. When when I get if I if I transfer you my private key uh, in in meat space, you have to trust that I don't still have a copy of the private key. Well, yeah, I kind of trust you, but a lot of transactions are done on trust. And and in fact, yeah, the, the classic cool. exact no no, but the exact yeah. classic example is how a high cryptocurrency is stolen. Mm -hmm. Somebody goes in there, they hack a computer, and they steal the private key. Well, now you have a change of ownership into the hands of a criminal mm -hmm. from an innocent person. Right. But then the, that person who stole it, then it quickly moves it, obviously, to another wallet, right? That it's person who stole it goes and spends it. And the example that I used, which is done through extortion, uh, uh, that we used in the uh, uh, Monitor Policy Group in our presentation to the European Commission, was they went uh, the stolen key, the extorted key, was used to buy a fertilizer and diesel fuel to make a bomb and blow up a federal building. Mm -hmm. And then along comes the, these, these blockchain surveillance companies and put the blame on a completely innocent uh, couple for what is actually in the United States a capital offense. So you, you don't foresee, you know, this, you're just, you do have a dis, potentially a dystopian image for Bitcoin. It's just a dis, different dystopian image, right? Like, so you I think... For most, it's it's this concern that there'll be mass surveillance, right? That I won't be able to get, go and buy meat because there'll be a meat quota, and either they'll know my my credit card transactions, or they'll they'll know it from you know the fact that everybody's using traceable Bitcoin through the Lightning Network, and you know my quota has been met, and now I'm cut off from from the system, or you know being tracked. This is like the kind of dystopian view of of Bitcoin, right? That it's a surveillance mm -hmm. coin. You don't you don't really agree with that that potential scenario at all, but you do see a dystopian scenario of Bitcoin with regards to people being falsely accused of things. I mean, do you see that? As Correct. Being very, very, very much so. To the point that I would not touch Bitcoin as I would not, I know, to spend it outside. Uh, I, I, I mean, if I were given a Bitcoin that could be traced to me, I would not be, I would not buy a Bitcoin and spend it. Do you think that's something that the governments will like intentionally abuse because of chain analysis existing and just you know the, the, the tool will be abused and it'll will be abused by governments for a reason to basically well, have, have, I, you know, have control over people i think that in countries that have a reasonably independent judiciary mm -hmm. that is not going to happen the courts will put a stop okay uh so i am not concerned in the long term for united states or canada or the european union or uh, it, is, it is quite possible in, in countries that are very, very authoritarian uh, and that that could be used in a very abusive manner. But I think it's, but in the meantime, a lot of people are going to get hurt. And this is this is the problem. This is a fact what I think is the essence of the legal case uh, at stake is the fact that, and this is why I don't see it's helpful to say that Bitcoin is a surveillance coin. Uh, I don't think that's true at all. But it lends itself to these false accusations. But I, but I think one has to give a lot more credit to the amount of privacy that there is in Bitcoin, actually. Do you see, so in terms of it being traceable uh, or, you know, however you, you want to define it. Um, so you see an issue with that being that, you know, false accusations. How about security? Does it, does it reduce Bitcoin security potentially? Uh, what would, uh... The, the, the traceability of Bitcoin. All right, so maybe well, mass, mass surveillance is impossible, but you know you can be pinpointed, and you know a government can potentially know how how much Bitcoin you have, or a criminal, right? Um, um, I, I think the problem that Bitcoin has, as if fundamentally, is much more is significant than that, and it's the question of its security on the basis of uh, falling block rewards. 
No, <laughs> yeah, no, I don't, I don't, no, no, but, but aside from that, I, I, I don't I would, know. I would stick to fully understanding your your take on Bitcoin with regards to its privacy. And yeah, I and what you see, whether you see that being an issue at all, or it's basically. A, <laughs> essentially equivalent to Monero in terms of privacy and fungibility. No, it's not. No, it's not. And this is the point that I'm trying to make. It is certainly not essentially equivalent to Monero. Only because Monero... Bitcoin Monero also false, blocks false, the false, false accusations, or at least to the degree that nobody even tries. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's the important distinction. So, it, and, and in fact, I would argue that the more I look into this issue, the more I'm convinced that Monero has to go for that would be much stronger on privacy. Uh, guy with Seraphis and uh, and a full membership group. Um, because in reality, the false accusation signal, the strength of that is way stronger than the actual true spend. And even if you were to address the problem in the United States and the European Union, in all of these places, you're still going to have parts of the world and governments that will still try to play the game. And accuse people. So you still need, in fact, you probably even need more the the kind of uh, privacy technologies that Monero has. So it's not equivalent to Monero uh, because what's going to happen is, and I think could very easily happen, is that people are going to start coming to the realization if I use Bitcoin, I'm going to be falsely accused. And that's even more powerful than saying I'm going to be surveilled by the government because you can't defend yourself saying I've got nothing to hide. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like, you know, if you think about it from this perspective, I mean, I was never, a, I mean, I, 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 a big thing on, on privacy until I started learning about these blockchain surveillance companies. Because then I realized that it's not good enough to just create a big enough uncertainty that it's not practical to surveil. You have to actually make it so blatantly obvious that nobody will try. Right. And, and currently they obviously are trying in Bitcoin and it's created this ecosystem where you have the chain analysis companies in bed with the regulators who are in bed with the exchanges who have to implement the regulations and just well, of... the, the, the blocks I, I, put, I don't yeah. like calling them uh, um, chain analysis because chain analysis implies that you're analyzing things on a blockchain which is you you're basically analyzing relationships between anonymous outputs that's not what these companies are doing these companies are making assumptions heuristics some of which are completely false of and how they link those outputs on the blockchain, so they're not just the blockchain, to persons of persons. So when you call it chain analysis, it implies you're analyzing the blockchain. Well, you're not. You're surveilling the blockchain to accuse people. It's very different. And it's where you cross that threshold, where you go across that threshold from saying, um, I'm just going to look at correlations between outputs. And I'm going to then make guesses about criminality and allegations of criminality and then start hurting people based on those guesses. That's when you move into the realm of blockchain surveillance. And that's the, the, the distinction. So you're not just analyzing the blockchain. That's a big misconception. What you're doing is you, you, you have this information. You have a lot of missing pieces. You guess about it. You hide behind NDAs. You hide behind uh, all of these uh, proprietary information, all this kind of stuff. And then you turn around and make accusations based on that. And people are getting hurt. So what do you think would be the proper name for the tool then? For the uh, Blockchain surveillance. Just blockchain surveillance. Okay. Surveillance. Because in surveillance, okay. the distinction between surveillance and analysis, when you surveil somebody, you make sure you, you don't want that person to know you're being surveilled. You don't want them to know how you're surveilling them. You want to hide the fact that they've been surveilled. Hence, and yes, hence, don't disclose the source code. Hence, don't disclose the assumptions. Hence, don't disclose the number of hops. All of these questions. 
but yes, it's called blockchain, but you don't think it actually is working as blockchain surveillance, even well, though it's failed. It's failed. It's failed. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It, it's basically what you're trying to do is you're, you're trying to surveil the blockchain, but what you actually are doing is it's ineffective as a, as a surveillance tool. But that's what you're trying to do. If you say chain analysis, what you're saying is you're analyzing the blockchain outputs as they appear. Now you can do that in Monero. Mm -hmm. It's 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 there's nothing, it's nothing, but that's totally deterministic. Mm -hmm. Where it becomes problematic is when you go and make this leap and you say this output is associated with some activity or some allegedly criminal activity. And then I'm gonna I'm gonna say this other output. It's, a, it's allegedly associated with, per, with a person or persons. And then I'm going to accuse those per or persons of the criminal activity. But you have miss, you're missing a lot of the pieces to do that. Yeah. But I mean, that, that's how all surveillance really works, right? It's, it's probabilistic and it's... Well, within reason. I mean, no. uh, and this is, again, where you get at what point in time is it unreasonable? Uh, to say just it's probabilistic, I mean, is the probability 1% or is it like uh, uh, the error rate 1% or is the error rate 99%? That's a big difference. Is your, is your error rate 0.01% or 0.01%? That's not the error rate. So, yeah, there may be some probabilistic elements, but simply to say it's probabilistic is not good enough. What it has to say is what is the error rate? How accurate are the results? How reliable is this? How about how about its its censorship resistance, right? So nobody could stop you from sending a Bitcoin transaction, obviously. Um, but does its quote does blockchain surveillance potentially lead to some form of censorship? Absolutely. It but again, it's it's censorship based on false accusations. Right, but it, it opens the door to censorship. Whereas with yes, Monero, because no, because there you can't even allege a false accusation, it, it would be very um, difficult to have justification to censor. Uh, I would argue you can. Actually, it's just a lot harder to do. But like, if, just so I understand, right, or and so you understand my question, right? Like, you could, you could, a government could approach. Uh, I mean, I go, I go, and tell them that certain transactions need to be censored, and they could okay, because let me they give could you, delineate different transactions. Whereas with Monero, what what, what would you even tell miners to do? How no, no, you could basically say this output is tainted, mm -hmm. and even if you dilute the taint with sixteen other outputs, fifteen other outputs is still tainted. So you block that chain, or you block the next chain. So you can still do that. Mm -hmm. Uh, what has effectively happened is that they've given up, and, and in many cases, what they've done is, is simply say, "Well, it's Monero; we don't want to touch it," um, which is kind of what, the, what you would force to do with a zero knowledge proof. But in theory, you could do the same thing. You could say, "Well, one of the outputs is bad; that it's in the ring signature. We don't even know if there's funds there or not." It's a lot harder to do. The point is, is the sales pitch didn't sink in Monero, and, it's, and it makes sense because it, it's a, it's so obviously much more difficult to do. It's appealing in Bitcoin. It's not appealing in Monero to the layperson. That's the distinction. Mm. So it's a, it's, it is a matter of degree, and it is a matter of can you sell it? Well, they can't really make. But there are companies who are trying to sell it. I mean, the IRS goes and puts out a bounty for Tracy Monero. And somebody else goes, yeah, yeah, we could do this. And take some money. So you're going to make it blatantly obvious that that doesn't work. Right. And now, now the IRS has the incentive to, to use blockchain surveillance as a tool to make accusations against people, right? Yeah, but, but that's essentially what I ended up doing. That's essentially what? That's a, they'll end up making accusations. Now, again, right, the that's, a problem. Are, that's a problem, right? That's what I'm saying. So of course, it's, sir, yeah. giving governments more, more power, they, whether the tool works or not, it is giving them a tool to uh, control and influence well, society more. The difference is if you have a independent judiciary, then the thing is going to sooner or later blow up in their face. 
that's the difference. Yeah, I mean, what we see, though, typically with governments, right, it's kind of like the ratchet effect. They move forward, uh, and then it's very hard to ratchet things back. Well, Even you, if those you, things may, quote, unquote, be illegal in, in the eyes of, you know, whatever the customer. Let, let me give you an example. This is a very well known. It's a clipper chip in the 1990s. Mm -hmm. Now, this thing was designed to surveil telephone conversations, basically on landlines. And... What happened with the clipper ship was that somebody went ahead, hacked the thing, proved it didn't it didn't work. And it had a lot of similarities to blockchain surveillance because one of the similarities was that it was proprietary. It was a company who sold the thing to government. So it has all the similar dynamic. Once it was proven a failure and a hack, what happened? The government retreated from the whole thing. And we haven't seen attempts at blocking encryption at the basic level. So the government has been reduced to try to go after intermediaries. So if you look at what example happened in the United Kingdom, what they actually did is they said, okay, if you have the key, you got to help us. you got to give us the information. Probably the most famous case, a lot of people sort of don't, uh, didn't follow. I, I followed Apple versus the Apple versus uh, uh, USA case, the US government. And what had happened there is you had an, an iPhone that belonged to the employer of a terrorist. The employer owned the iPhone and they were fully cooperating with the FBI. And they wanted to Apple to help them decrypt the thing. Now, the way this works on Apple, and it's the reason why I think Apple devices are so hackable, is that Apple has this pin that you enter into the phone to unlock it. If you think of how a pin works, for example, in a bank machine, it's one in 10,000 chance that you could correctly guess it randomly. You are a four-digit pin, roughly one in 10,000. So what happens is you go to the automated teller machine and stick the, the, the card in. After three tries, what happens, it's, it, it eats the card and says, no more tries. So the bank protects itself because you can't essentially brute force it. If it's a device that you control, that you have, well, in principle, you should be able to, to brute force it. What Apple did is it concocted a bunch of proprietary software and DRM, which of, to which they held the key, and prevented that brute forcing from happening. So they created a huge DRM to create the stop and lock it out. Right, when your phone locks. Exactly. But that is based on a flawed technology, named the DRM. The FBI comes along and says, help us. And Apple says, we don't have the key. Yes, you do. And that's what the entire uh, lawsuit said. And in fact, we're using a law, which is the All Writs Act, which was passed in the 18th century in the United States, to force Apple to break its DRM. How did this end? Well, it ended because the FBI found an Israeli company to hack the phone and then they could brute force it. Which means all along Apple had the key, they just didn't want to give it. So they had the key. And the old Red Sox passed in the 1700s was applicable. The problem is they wanted to pretend they didn't have the key for marketing reasons. And everybody seemed to think that Apple was fighting for people's privacy. And so, no, they were not. They were fighting for a flawed business plan based on DRM and, 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 and controlling how people use their iPhones. But it was a very, very interesting case. And had it gone to court, I think the FBI would have won. And, and it should have, correctly. What's interesting is why an Israeli company, I'll tell you why. Because the United States has a law called the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which makes it a felony to break DRM. So what the government does is they go to a country where it's not illegal to do this, and there's a massive industry to do that, and that's why they do it in Israel, not in the United States. In fact, in Canada, it's legal to break DRM if your privacy has been threatened. But not in the U.S. Hmm. So, so this is kind of the kind of stuff we're dealing with. So there is a fiction and a reality. So people think that Apple is protecting people's privacy. They're not. They're covering their own, but they don't want to tell people, no, no, we concocted this thing called DRM. It's really fake. We have the keys. 
And so we're going to fight the FBI. And in fact, if you read the the actual, which I did read it, it was very interesting. It could have been read, it could have been written by the Free Software Foundation. It was all about proprietary control over the keys by Apple. Mm-hmm. I mean, literally, if you are a free software enthusiast, you read this thing. Now, who wrote this? Because basically, that's what they were arguing. That's what the FBI was arguing. And so this is the kind of stuff we're dealing with. It's not as simple as it's made out to be. So, uh, yeah, it's a tough one. But Slight, it, slightly off topic, but you have me thinking. I don't think I ever asked you this. Um, yes. The, the curve that uh, Monero uses to derive its uh, public key from private key versus the right. one that Bitcoin uses. They use different different curves, right? Like Monero's is yeah, 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 yeah. five yeah. five one nine mm-hmm. or whatever. And what's Bitcoin's? It's uh, you're, seven... you're hitting one area that I'm not an expert in. But, but, but oh, okay. Like, All right, I just really that's a... one area that I'm not a, a real okay. expert. Okay, I want I want to get your opinion on it because uh, you, safe curves and the fact that you know Monero's elliptic curve is is, is rated as as safe and and bitcoins is not i was curious i don't you know this is it's, it's for our cryptographer uh but that's I was, a basically for a cryptographer and, and i mean there, there are people in the community who are better qualified to answer that okay. than i am you just had me thinking of it when you were talking about the uh, but uh, the, the the issue that i was mentioning is this business of you know the reality versus the fake and and this is why you know it's it, Companies create some very elaborate structures. So you create a pretty, you know, should Alice's basic papier that they're this reputable company doing this stuff. But as you get to the bottom, the whole thing is, is on a very, very tricky foundation. Mm-hmm. It is, but like I said, we know we know how governments work, and you know, they'll they'll just they'll abuse it and use it. And whether or not it's ultimately illegal, um, we could they could abuse it for quite some time before you know they'll, they'll the law kind of catches up with them. Well, I think it's more a case that they're being taken in this case. They're being what? That the government has been taken. Pure and simple. They've been sold, basically, snake oil. Mm-hmm. Uh, and people don't like to be taken. And they're going pre- to be in denial. When they realize they've been taken you will see the backlash and it's not going to be pretty. Yeah, I don't know. See, I don't know if I agree with that because I, I would argue potentially that they're tied in with the quote-unquote government, right? Like, I don't know if they're taken by it. They're benefiting from it as well. Like, No, no, no. The government is the one that's taken, not the trade analysis company. No, I, I get that. But I'm saying I, I see a scenario where they're in bed with the government because uh, that's typically s- how governments work just like the weapons companies being in bed with the government which is why we continually see more but, war right so it's but if you have a weapons company let me give you this analogy that makes a tank that doesn't work and fires the missiles in some other direction where it's supposed to be going that's yeah, what we're i don't doing. know if that's really the, the analogy is really yeah. they have a tool now that they can use to you they know, think better, they can better, use better control people, right? And there, there's no, no. They think they can use. See, that's the problem, right? Even if it's, it's false. does the tool work? If the tool doesn't work, then it'll blow up in the face of the government. Mm-hmm. And yeah. so eventually, that will happen. Question, yeah. but in the meantime, a lot of people are going to get hurt. I mean, I guess a good analogy, like like pharmaceutical companies, right? Um, okay. Yeah, they, they offer tools that the government uses. Do all those tools necessarily work, and they all necessarily good for society, or have we? Well, uh, they yeah. offer tools to people. The government tries to regulate, then they lobby the government to get it through. In some cases, they they get it through, and a lot of people get hurt. In other cases, right. they don't, and the government stops the problem. And the famous example, I mean, I'm of a generation where I could have easily have become severely crippled by uh, thalidomide. And the U.S. government was one of the few in the world that stood up and said no. So that's the, and pretty well every other government did not. So it, it, it's 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 not the case that it's the government that's the, that's the bad guy here necessarily. I put more of the blame on the, on the actual companies. 
So let me ask you this. Do you see chain analysis or uh, blockchain surveillance companies essentially going away in the next 10 to 20 years? Like when oh, the, jig, the jig will be up? Uh, sooner or later, the jig is going to be up. And they're going to be, and, and, and it's not going to be pretty. It's totally unsustainable. Wow. I don't know. I don't know. That's that's the, who who's who have you spoken to in the Monero community? Um, well, uh, that, that has uh, opposing views. Uh, that has a, uh, you know somebody that I, that I I could potentially get on. The phone. I was I forgot how people come to my way of thinking, but I had a lot of people in the Monero community who had opposing views. Some of them were in the policy group, mm -hmm. uh, but I convinced them. Okay. Uh, but I have. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of people who, uh, the problem also is, and this is what occurred in the Bitcoin community, it's a lot of people naively thought that by going along with this blockchain surveillance, they can get better terms from governments. And the truth of the matter is they didn't. But especially in Bitcoin, they wanted to convince people to not do travel rule. It's a good example. And we're going to do this instead. When the Bonino policy group supported the US government position of FinCEN of treating cryptocurrencies as if they were fungible assets, same as cash or gold or something like that, which is really what they are. Uh, we, we were one of the few, and if not the only, that we actually were in, in direct opposition to most members of the blockchain communities. Mm. Because most people supported these companies. That's the problem. And they were sold. I mean, you would they, they, what the government was asking for, you know, five years ago, they were asking for travel rule. They were asking for the same rules that applied to cash. That's what they were asking for. But then a combination of these blockchain surveillance companies that had money to make, and a lot of members within the Bitcoin community said, no, 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 you can use this instead. And in fact, what we have is both. Right. So, so they, they created a monster, which is now a real problem. And, or the only thing you have to do is throw Monero under the bus. You can't list Monero. Right. Because it's obvious it doesn't work. Do you love coffee and Monero as much as we do? Consider making gratuitous.org your daily cup. Pay with Monero for premium fresh beans. And if you like what you taste, send a digital cash tip directly to the Guatemalan farmers that made it possible. Proceeds help us grow this channel, Gratuitous, and Monero. The Bitcoin community thought they could, they could, if they accepted blockchain surveillance, they wouldn't have to put up a travel rule. Right. They got both. Okay. But there is an incentive there for the for these chain analysis companies to, to get to, this is the point I want to make, right? To want to get the Bitcoin community to, to adopt this. And the Bitcoin community, uh, or the, some of them were okay with it because they saw it as a means by which governments would be more friendly towards cryptocurrency. And they were more concerned about that, right? About the adoption of Bitcoin and governments not being basically number go up, right? They wanted number go yeah, up. Yeah, that, so that's to a, that, up. that's a very correct assessment. Uh, in fact, that is in fact a very correct assessment. The problem is the governments went and took both. Mm -hmm. So if they had done nothing, we would be way better off. And I don't think the governments would be less accepting of of. Uh, uh, if anything, it's also created situations like. Uh, uh, the, the, they would have focused more on the on the exchanges, which they should have been doing, and they might even have uh, 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 avoided fraud such as FTX. But by, it, it's a, it was a major distraction. There's no denying it. And I think basically one of the things that could happen is once the jig is up on blockchain surveillance, and I think it's only a matter of time before it is, there could be a backlash as a whole uh, towards the crypto industry. Because keep in mind, a lot of people within the crypto industry push this thing. And then uh, uh, turns out to be a complete failure. Nobody likes to be to be made a fool, particularly if you're a government. Oh, and then there'd be backlash against crypto in general from governments because now... Oh, yes, I would expect that because they'd be made to look like other fools. Hmm. 
So it's a very dangerous game that has been played here. And then, the, and then there'll be when you say backlash, you mean so then there'll be more apt to to want to e regulate crypto even more. Than they yes, are. yes, they would. Yeah. But I think that's going to have to be a small price to pay. The, the The approach that many have taken is if we simply got rid of Monero and and then they play things like Dash, which has got less privacy than Bitcoin Cash. It's, and in fact, Dash is one of the easiest coins to do blockchain surveillance because of its size. It's an ideal coin to test these algorithms on, actually. It's crazy this is there, but it is because it's a very small blockchain. Right. And they've they're coined it a privacy coin, Dash, right? Well, it was called a dark coin at one point. Right. They've gone out of their way to a brand away from privacy. Yeah, I think they've even said like a couple of years ago, like we're not. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I mean, and the fact of the matter is that they've been mined simply because it's sales. It's about sales, which is not about any logical element. I mean, there's less privacy in Dash than there is in Litecoin or Bitcoin Cash. Because they haven't updated their privacy like in eight years. So I just, I just want to kind of get into, you know, the, the topic of, and we, we were touching about it a little bit, but just the regulations that we see coming down in Europe. Mm -hmm. um, oh, the, yeah, um, the, 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 the travel rule, which you essentially kind of already spoken about, but how these things, where, where you see things going with regards to regulation well, in Europe and the United States regarding quote unquote privacy coins. Well, I see a lot is going to depend on the legal situation. Um, because I don't think the legal situation is sustainable. I don't think this is going to get resolved through at the legislative level or at the lobbying level. I really more and more believe that it's going to be resolved in the courts. Uh, in the courts in the United States, in the courts in the European Union, particularly things like the European Court of Human Rights, uh, and in the courts around the world. Um, because that's where this jig has to be. Up. Well, you have something that's based on essentially a f uh, it, that it's been sold successfully to, to legislators and to governments. Uh, that's where it's going to show. Now, there's a critical difference between the United States and the European community here, in the European Union. I'll tell you, what, there's no baking of blockchain surveillance in the law of the United States. In fact, the legislation that was passed by Congress, it was bipartisan in the dying days of the Trump administration, literally said what we said should happen, which let's treat crypto like a fungible asset. So they were treating it the same as bearer bonds and cash and precious metals and this kind of stuff. The regulations that FinCEN put together after that were based on that, which, were, which is why we supported it. In fact, of all of the policy groups that the, uh, that the uh, Monero Policy Working Group put out. The one where we actually fundamentally agreed with the government was the case of the United States. What they're trying to do in the European Union is they're trying to bake blockchain surveillance into the legislation. And this is the Section 76, used to be called Section 68 of the MICA. And that's the rule that I think is the most dangerous. Because essentially what it says is it puts incredibly onerous requirements if the coin cannot be surveilled with blockchain surveillance. In a, well, you can't fake it. That's essentially what it is. So they kind of, they really got into it to lobby for that particular section. So what I think is going to happen, and this is where I think there are different points of view on this. If the legal winds start to blow in, you know, in, in our favor, then we're going to see either that section challenged or, and this is, I think, some people in, in the policy group, maybe uh, um, Robin would be a good example of that, are saying, well, this is so onerous, they're going to sort of find a way of not enforcing it. And, 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 and so this interpretation and so, because it doesn't make sense. If, on the other hand, uh, it goes, the, you know, there's no legal breakthrough, then it, the most the likely consequence would be that Monero would be delisted in every exchange in the European Union. Now, will that lead to a, a human rights challenge? I would hope so. What do you see as being the, the 
practical implications for adoption and usage of Monero versus Bitcoin. So in this scenario, they're clamping down on Monero, they're delisting it, it's becoming more difficult to obtain. Chain analysis companies are still running the show, uh, but they're slowly, you know, the rug hasn't been pulled out from other than them yet. Um, how do you see that affecting uh, adoption and the growth of Bitcoin versus Monero? Well, Bitcoin, what you're going to see in the case of Monero is inflation. Let me put it to you another way. And this is kind of what I was talking about in Monero Topia. Hmm. If I, if you take out the KYC Monero out of the equation, you're going to create inflation in the non-KYC markets. And the reason is exactly the, the what I presented in Monero Topia. Because you're taking a usage out of the coin. So you see a fixed number of coins, you remove a bunch of users. Then what you're going to do is you're going to cause inflation in the remaining markets. Um, what we're seeing right now is probably a dynamic between the two, but uh, and it's quite possible. You can't ban it. So what they're going to try and do is keep it out of exchanges and so on, try to and effectively end up driving it underground. Of course, you could have like 20 years, like well, 30 years, like what happened with marijuana. In Canada, it's legal. But it was after years of it being commonly used on the ground, so it could be driven on the ground um, in the short term. So it definitely inhibit adoption. Uh, the other problem is, is a lot of people see Monero as an on-ramp onto coins like Ethereum. So, for example, I, I regularly visit an Ethereum group in Vancouver, and they see Monero as a way to get Ethereum privately. And, and because the thing is this. Things like um, travel rule are really not an issue if you simply go to a KYC exchange, buy Monero, withdraw it, and then spend it like cash. So you avoid all of the problems. So I see in the negative situation this kind of sideways movement that we see right now. The thing is, it's it's sort of the, there's a lot of resistance to that because you have two things. You still have a significant amount of KYC monitor going on. They're not going to completely eliminate it. And at the same time, you have a a growing market in the no KYC side. So you see this dynamic between the two, and prices remaining stable. But it's definitely hindered on option. There's no denying that that if, if it weren't for the for these blockchain surveillance companies, I would think Monero would be way ahead of where it is right now. But on the other side of the coin, uh, to use a pun there, we are seeing because, be, you know, Monero actually growing in organic use, right? So, yeah, it's harder for people to obtain. It's being at attacked in the, you know, on, on the on the clear net, right? But on the in the dark markets, Monero is growing in usage and adoption. So it's actually... As as and as governments seem to cl clamp down more, it seems to be growing more for that actual real world use case. I think we even just saw today on Twitter somebody posted a, another market, uh, cipher market, just went, went from being uh, Bitcoin and Monero to Monero only. Um, so, it, how do you see, see that the, playing out? See, basically, what I see is if if we were to take this blockchain surveillance issue out of the equation. Mm -hmm. Darknet markets are essentially the canary in the coal mine. If you look historically, markets that are on the verge of society, on the fringes of society, tend to be the earliest early adopters. So under normal circumstances, you would expect adoption first to take place in the darknet markets and then move to the white markets or the, in the clear markets. Mm -hmm. And the best example of this is what was the first application of video on the internet? Pornography. Right. But what was the first application of people drawing on caves? Pornography. <laughs> 10,000 years ago. This is, this is what I'm getting at. So this is not a new thing. Look at the pottery from that's, you know, from antiquity. So this kind of stuff has always been the leader in new adoptions of new technologies. Right, and, and that's what I'm trying to say. Is it potentially could? Is there a positive argument there, uh, or an optimistic argument that even if if governments 
let's say, become more onerous <laughs> against Monero and there's more bannings, do we see growth in real more further you could. organic adoption of Monero for the actual use case of transacting on the internet anonymously? Yeah, I, uh, you could, absolutely. I, I don't see why not. I would expect it in a normal circumstance, put government issue aside, uh, that the first growth would be in the internet markets, the dot net markets. So, so this is the thing to, to realize. This might skew it a bit, but over the long term, no. I don't think it's going to have a fundamental impact. First of all, because ultimately you're dealing on something that's fundamentally flawed and sooner or later it's going to collapse. If Europe, so, goes, if Europe goes in this direction, which you're saying there is a scenario where that could happen, right? Where they could... Mm -hmm find the political will to basically ban ban Monero, right? In Europe. If well, I think a lot's gonna I, I think the key I think one of the big key players right now is gonna be the United States. Well that's what I want to ask you next. So you see a scenario though where that could happen in Europe, then what do you think that means for the United does the United States follow or it plays out I think the United States would lead because I think what could happen is that Europe goes in this, the United States leads in, in the freedom side on this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and that triggers a legal action in the European Union. Mm. I see. So, I, so I'm actually quite more optimistic of that. Yeah. Because I suspect, I mean, once the case of false accusations gets made, it's going to transcend way even, I mean, for example, it would apply to Sharia law, which affects a lot of the, of, of the Muslim world. Why was it banned in Dubai, in, in the United Arab Emirates? Well, the minute that happened, I was researching Sharia, Sharia law on, on false accusations. Ah. Because Dubai... That, that was the, the reason? It wasn't, you know, to prevent money laundering? Well, no, 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 no. What I was looking at is how are false accusations treated under Sharia law? Yeah. Because that's the basis of the legal system in the United Arab, uh, Arab Emirates yes. and Dubai, which Dubai is one of the Emirates. If it turns out that blockchain surveillance leads to false accusations, it's a great example, for example, in the United States, then now you've got a really strong case for declaring it haram under Sharia law, which is basically banned. So that's my point, is that it, it's not, it, 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 there's a synergy here. If you get a, a breakthrough in one country, I expect it's going to start breaking through somewhere. Now, I want to make sure I understood you there. Because, I mean, what we saw with Monero was banned, right, in, in Dubai. No, first of all, it was not banned in Dubai. This is not true. Okay, explain. What they did in Dubai is that you needed to do additional, they took a much milder approach. Dubai is not a ban. If someone wants to run it in Dubai, they have to do more extensive due diligence. This is the compromise approach. What is so it? It's not banned in Dubai. What well, happening? you have to check more of the people's KYC, basically. Mm -hmm. Okay, you have to do additional... Additional due diligence, which is kind of what happens in Canada right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so no, so it's not banned in Dubai. That's not true. If you actually, I actually read the Dubai uh, regulation. It's not banned in Dubai. Okay. Far from it. And so it's it's legal to transfer with. Oh, absolutely. No, no, it's absolutely. Yeah, no, it's just it's this extra step. Yeah. It it's not like the European one. The Dubai one is not compared to the European. one. But was the point you were trying to make with Sharia Sharia law is that is that you ban. Blockchain surveillance. Right. Because, because they, of the false accusation. The minute the you die, you pull the plug from the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So you see that happening, a scenario where they they, they, they may lead lead the, the way on that and ban, banning. I see, I see one country, could be the United States, could even be the European Union, if there's a challenge in the European Court of Human Rights, taking the lead. And once one major one, then the rest are going to fall. But right now we have a trend in one direction and that could turn in a day. I'm actually quite optimistic about this, to be honest. Because ultimately when you get down to it, the whole thing is based on a, a, a very shaky foundation. Keep If you keep prodding around a building that's built on a shaky foundation, sooner or later it's gonna collapse. I don't know, Fiat's built on a shaky foundation. It's lasted mm, for much stronger than this. <laughs> I mean, well, this, I mean, there's a, lot, there's a lot of scams between uh, corporations and governments, right? Uh, oh, sure. Uh, 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 but that has happened billion, for centuries. 
billion dollar, trillion dollar scams, right? That have persisted for a long time. So I don't know if I'm completely confident that the the jig will be up for for blockchain surveillance. I can, I can see I, potentially going in another direction. Well, this is what's interesting. I think that it won't pass legal muster. I think it's it's got a, and that's where you get into the problem. But in the short term, yes, the trend is very much in the direction of favoring it right now, mm -hmm. which is why we'll be seeing these delistings. Monero has been remarkable holding its own in the face of this, to be honest. And I think you're probably right. One of the reasons is because of these DNM markets. Mm -hmm. I missed your talk. Uh, I, I started watching it today a little bit in preparation for this, the recording. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I was running around Monero Topia. I wasn't able. What it, it was a, a case for the fundamental value of Monero. Yes. What were essentially the key points you were making from that? From the that? basic element, the basic element there is if you look at uh, the equation of exchange, the equation of exchange, uh, most people think of the equation of exchange as Keynesian economics. Uh, and they don't think of it of Austrian economics. So if you look at an Austrian currency, Austrian economics is basically based on gold. And so what happens in Austrian economics if you, if you look at gold itself, gold has a very interesting relationship. As you um, increase the money supply, you want to increase the money supply. As, as, as the economy of gold increases, there's a feedback loop that causes more gold mining. Mm -hmm. So if you have a gold economy, if, it, if there's economic growth, the price of gold goes up because you have a fixed amount of gold in the economy. But now there's an incentive to take more gold out of the ground. And so people think of gold as a fixed asset, one that it was a fixed, a limited supply. But in reality, what it is, is an infinite supply, a good model, infinite supply, but it's very difficult to get at. Mm -hmm. So if you increase the price, then you um, you track it. Right. You, you track economic growth. So if you think of the equation of exchange, which is MV equals PQ, which is the money, monetary, uh, uh, money supply times the velocity of money equals the price of goods and services. That's the total amount of goods and services. It's a tautology. Mm -hmm. Keynesians think around and say, okay, if the, so the classic, I mean, so we want to increase Q, i.e. The, the economy. So we're going to print more money. And what happens, of course, is that you can get an increase in Q initially, typically, and then you start getting an increase in P. So you create inflation. And this is the classic central bank problem. What I'm look, looked at in, in my talk is I went a step further. The, you take the equation of exchange and you apply it to a harder than gold currency. And Monero is a perfect example. So now you've got a very interesting dynamic. And the, money, uh, and the dynamic that you have is that you've got monetary supply is constant, which Monero it is with the tail emission reaching an equilibrium with, with the lost coins. Your velocity is over time constant. So now you've got just a constant equal to P times Q. Mm -hmm. If the size of the Monero economy goes up, and you increase Q, then P has to go down. You have deflation in the economy. So, and it's, in fact, an inverse relationship. But the other thing happens. As you increase the size of the Monero economy, you also increase the type of things you can buy with Monero. So you're going to get a faster then you can buy more expensive things, basically. Mm -hmm. You can go from socks to houses. So what happens is you have a faster growth than, than the linear. So you get a relationship between um, the increase in, in the economy. It will be faster than, um, than linear. So you have the, 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 because you're increasing more, you're increasing the type of queue. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. As you increase, as you increase the, the, the price, so then you look at the next thing. You look at two things. The next thing you look at, well, what's Q? If you assume the majority of the economy happens on chain, then Q is proportional to the block size. Now you and we'll, we'll get to the to my next point, which is why I sold my Bitcoin for Monero in 2014, 2015. As an investor, I realized this, and I'm saying, okay. If I want to get a return on this thing, I better invest in something that can increase the block size. Because if it can't increase the block size, it's not going to go up and buy. What I missed, of course, in the case of Bitcoin, is that you have a um, 
shift from the chain to banking type transactions. And that's what propped up the price of Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of the essence. So you have this, this relationship. So you have this increase in price. This is why I would argue the price of Bitcoin is totally unsustainable because they can't keep expanding Q because ultimately if the whole point of the economy is says it doesn't demediate the banks. So if you end up replacing with the banks, then what's the point? Mm -hmm. And that's what most of the major critics of Bitcoin are saying. So it goes to this argument that you can't have a growth in the economy without a growth in the block size. Mm. Essentially. That's, that's, that's the other side of the argument. But of course, there are related arguments, such as if you suddenly reduce the, the, the size of Q by getting rid of KYC Monero, you're going to cause P to, to go up. So you're going to go, you're going to create inflation. You're going to wait, create inflation of what? Of, um, I in, the, in the remaining market. So if you have a, a non-KYC market and you get rid of the KYC market, uh -huh. there's going to be inflation in the non-KYC market. And that's going to affect the price in what way? Well, yeah. Like if you're in a DNM market, the price of whatever you buy there is going to go up if the you price. get rid of the KYC market. Right. Put it bluntly. Right. Your Monero will be worth less. It will be worth less in terms yeah. of whatever you're buying. Right. Right. In terms of whatever you're buying. But... If you get rid of Kate, why? I because I, I, you said it before earlier, but now I, I'm totally understanding your your you know your MVPQ here uh, explanation with why Monero must will go up in value as essentially as adoption grows as the economy yes. of Monero gets larger. Yes. Q P has to essentially go down, which is the price of the price of goods so, 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 relative so, 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 yeah. to Monero. So you're buying right. you buy more goods with one Monero. Uh, Correct. Your Monero be becomes worth more over time. P gets, yes. P goes down, price of goods go down. But now you're saying uh, in this potential scenario, applying that to a scenario where let's say Europe bans Monero. So now you're getting- well, It doesn't ban Monero. What they did, what, they're not going to ban Monero in Europe. Well, I'm just what they're going to do. Up. What they're going to what they're saying is they're going to not allow you to trade it on exchanges. So essentially, you're eliminating the KYC market. Right. Okay, and you're getting rid of KYC Monero. Basically, yeah. So what you've done is you reduce whole, Q. You're you're shrinking the economy. Of you're shrinking the economy, so therefore right. you're going to create inflation in the remaining markets, which theoretically would go or will more be more dominated by the NM markets. So don't make right. Markets. Right. Which the the you know me being the eternal Monero optimist is well we're creating a more pure and organic economy that's actually based on utility of people using mm, it. Well, no, you just said, let me you're making it smaller because there's a lot of utility for people who would want to trade cash for Monero and buy things uh, on open markets. What you're doing is you're slowing down the growth of Monero because essentially, mm -hmm. eventually it will it will filter back. You're just slowing it down. Mm -hmm. But you're in the short term, you're going to create inflation in those markets. That's what I'm saying. Right. But you're also increasing those markets, which is increasing that economy. Not necessarily. No, 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 you're not. No, the, the, the size of that economy, I, I, I don't, I, 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 the, the end of markets are not driven by the KYC markets. I, I see the other way around. They tend to be earlier adopters. So, no, I don't think no, you're going to increase the, the size of those saying, markets. No, you know, it, Yes, with, with the size of the, the I, I see the size of those markets getting larger over time. They're going to get much larger regardless. So right. it, what you may happen is that that compensates for the loss of the KYC. Market. Exactly. That's, that's a possibility. That is definitely MVP a possibility. Q, uh, Q to that, right? And the, the dark markets are getting larger over time because of actions like the banning of Monero. No, 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 not because of that. But on a societal, on a societal level, right? When governments become more draconian, society tends to move towards dark markets, right? Like okay, fair enough. That that is that is an argument, but I don't think in this case that in it's history, history, right? You saw that <coughs> because basically what's happening in Europe. What's happening in Europe is Monero is a very small portion of the overall crypto market. This is the point that people are missing. So it's not going to have an impact on the overall crypto cryptocurrency market. Mm -hmm. uh, if anything, because of there may be a, a, I mean, I expect, for example, my expectation is it's going to be a backlash and, and, and blockchain surveillance is going to collapse. The likely result of that would be a significant increase in the Monero market. But in the short term, you're probably going to see a drop in, in, in a lot of the other crypto markets, maybe because of the disruption it creates. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So I am not saying, and, and whether I really see the darknet markets as leaders, not followers of this. So they are not the following markets; they are the leading markets. And and so if you think of and the reasons historically, there's a lot of evidence for that. So yes, it is true if the overall if there's an overall uh, clampdown that drives people into, into a government. But if it's just specific to one coin, which is what's going on here, no, I don't think that's going to have an impact of uh, of that at all. Because it's not, they're clamping on crypto all the time. They're targeting specifically, the biggest one being Monero, simply because it's a convenient scapegoat uh, more than anything else. So those, uh, th this is why the guys, uh, if you go to an exchange like uh, Coinbase, well, Monero is like two, less than one two hundredth, basically, of the price of Bitcoin. <coughs> right now, the market cap, it has no impact on the overall market. So it's not, so if you ban it, it's not going to have a significant impact on, it's not going to cause people to suddenly move to Bitcoin or something. You know, it's not going to happen. Right. It's not the dominant player. We're not number one. We're number uh, 22. We go up every time the Bitcoin price goes down, which again is really, uh, it's really interesting. Every time we see disruptions in the Bitcoin market as a whole, Monero goes up in market cap. I don't know, coin market. Have you noticed that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very much a counterplay. And, and the reason I think is because it's totally outside of the mainstream. It's been driven outside of the mainstream of the, of the crypto industry. Mm-hmm. I mean, basically, this, of the big exchanges, the biggest players, Kraken, Binance is trades in certain markets, but not in others. Um, and it's more popular than some of the more uh, lesser regulated exchanges. But so, so this is why I think it's a misconception. But I don't really think realistically <laughs> that the DNM markets are going to be impacted one way or the other by this stuff of... of uh, um, whether or not it's uh, uh, the, it, it's taking out of KYC exchanges. Yeah. They, well, they're going to do their thing and they're going to be the leading markets because yeah, that's yeah. historically... Like I said, I, I, I see that leading to a trend where the dark neck markets get larger because as, as governments <laughs> tend towards, you know, financial totalitarianism, people are going to want to transact uh, in anonymous and private ways through... Well, open that market. would be that's correct if you say, for example, you're talking about a, uh, a clampdowns in the banking system or instability in the banking system or so on. Um, and that's very true. And onerous but I, regulations. But the onerous the thing is, the thing about these regulations is that they're onerous for one specific coin. They're not particularly onerous for the rest of the coins. Hmm. So it's it's very Monero specific. And Monero is like a very small fraction of the overall market. So I don't think banning Monero in its own right is going to push people into, into crypto. Hmm. Well, Because it's too small a player. If he did that uh, with Bitcoin, uh, yes, I understand what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. But it's too but, small a player in the whole scheme of things. Right. But the, but the regulations are, are going up against Bitcoin as well. The KYC, AML, the, the MICA stuff, right? They're, they're making... Um, they're, Micah stuff is not, there's a lot of good stuff in there. Uh, if you take out, I mean, let me tell you one thing. If you were to take out that section 76.3, whatever it is that, that they call it, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we could probably have support for Micah in the Monero Policy Group. Much as, as what happened with the Fins and stuff. It's pretty mundane stuff that they're doing. They're not doing anything different than they're doing for cash. Okay. And they're creating us and they're creating certainty and so on. Uh, so people know where they stand and all that. You mentioned and in fact, in, interestingly enough, mm -hmm. uh, the rules for cryptocurrency are more lenient than the rules for cash in the European. Hopefully it stays that way. Uh, you, so, you, yeah, sorry. You mentioned that there could be some scenario, let's say, where things get uh, more onerous in Europe. Uh, the United States goes the opposite approach politically and, and move, starts to move in the opposite direction. Do you see that? being a, an issue that comes up maybe even in the next election uh, and maybe even to the degree where you see 
uh, you know, fingers crossed here. Maybe you see some candidates that are even pro privacy coins, pro Monero. As well, we're seeing that. We're seeing that already in in in, in Canada. But I think the real breakthrough in the United States. I really have more faith in the courts in this one than in Congress. Congress has already done some really good stuff. Mm-hmm. I mean, the paralysis is the best thing you have because Congress already acted, and what they passed was perfectly decent. This is why we supported the Monetary Policy Group. They already passed the legislation. So, so I think it's more, I think, a matter for the courts in the United States than it's a matter for Congress. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious, you know, even a presidential candidate like a, a Robert F. Kennedy or a DeSantis, you know, they've already all gotten on board of bashing CBDCs and being anti-central bank digital currency for reasons of... Uh, that it, it can lead to, to mass surveillance and gets rid of a, a, a cash-like utility for society. Well, so do they then start arguing? In fact, we need to be pro digital cash. Well, you have to if, if you're going to if you're going to ban, if you're uh, against CBDCs because they are a use of surveillance coins, mm-hmm. then you have to be in favor of privacy coins. Right. That's yeah. That's what that's what I'm getting. But, at. Yeah. So, but here's the thing. If you keep Monero out of the limelight, then they're not going to clue into that. Mm-hmm. But if you get Monero up into the limelight, then those people are going to clue, clue into that. How do we get it up into the limelight? What's your what's your? Well, thing? my but my basic my bet is on the legal side. Mm-hmm. To be honest, I in the United States, I think my bet is on the legal side. Eventually, this thing's gonna it's gonna get challenged in the courts. That's where my that's where I my money is right now. All right. So I I think that that the real breakthrough is going to come from the legal side, not from the legislative side in the United States. The legislative side is pretty decent the way it is right now. They're clamping down on on security coins that they should have clamped down ten years ago because that's where the FinCEN guidance was passed. What people don't realize is if you actually read the FinCEN regulations and the SEC regulations, Monero is one of the most compliant coins you can get your hands on. Right. That's the that's the part that people don't get about this whole thing. People think if you actually look at it, so they're clamping down on securities coins that are basic securities on a blockchain. Well, just because you put a security on a blockchain, you do not change legislation that was passed in the 1930s. So so yeah, that's supposed to happen. That's not gonna hurt Monero. Do you think, think Ethereum and Zcash could potentially be thrown into that mix, or you you put them in a, in the same category as like a Monero and a Bitcoin? Well, Ethereum is very different. Ethereum, I think, is going to break a break blockchain surveillance just by sheer mass. No, I mean for, uh, for being labeled securities and having to deal with. No, oh, oh, I see what you're saying. Okay, okay. there's a big difference here. Ethereum is very interesting because Ethereum, what they did is they, is they literally outmaneuvered the regulators with a good sets of lawyers. Mm-hmm. If you look at the launch of Ethereum, when it was launched in 2014, that was a security. The promise was the Ethereum. So if you think of Huawei, uh, the Huawei test, mm-hmm. so we had orange growth, right. and then the security around producing the oranges. Okay, in the Ethereum, the Ethereum is the oranges. Right, oranges aren't a security. Oranges aren't a security. This is why you can argue that Ethereum is not a security. The problem with Ethereum is that the process by which the Ethereum was created was an unregistered security. Mm-hmm. So they created a comp- an organization, actually, that created the Ethereum, and then they wound it up in Switzerland, and then they wound it up before the regulators knew what hit them, and all of a sudden, here's the Ethereum, which is not a security. Here are the oranges. And that they wound the whole thing up before the SEC got get their act together. Mm-hmm. And now they feel like, okay, we got taken here. That's essentially the situation with Ethereum. Ccash is a different kettle of fish because you have a centralized entity issuing money. Ccash is very much very vulnerable as a, any kind of thing where you have a pre mine, where you have a founder's reward or whatever you want to call it, and you're using the funds to promote it and you're using the funds to pay for developers. They right. don't get around the problem on that. Yeah, that's that's what I always say. So, do you actually see that? Because I, I see that as an issue. I mean, do you see that? Because All of them, are, yeah. I mean, if you go down the list that don't have a securities issues, Bitcoin, 
in order of uh, Dogecoin, Litecoin, Monero, and I think the next one is Bitcoin Cash. Right, and you're saying and that, everything else is problematic. And well, you're saying and Ethereum doesn't really have the problem either, right? Because it's kind of well, Ethereum. Yeah, yeah but the, you get into the question as to whether the Ethereum Foundation was related to the original entity that created the security, and that's where it's the hardest. Is. Wait, look, your your order was from wait from from best to worst. Wait, let me let me hear it. So like, like the only ones that are not that I don't feel securities would be Bitcoin. Dogecoin, Litecoin, Monero. Next one is Bitcoin Cash. Okay. Why do you put Monero so low? I'm curious. I'm going by order of market cap. Market cap. Okay. Not not other. There's no other feet like. There's uh, no other. Wrong. There's no other reason. Yeah, okay. They're fundamentally the same. Bitcoin's approach is Litecoin's the case the same. Dogecoin was actually a fork from the. None of them went ahead and got their hands in the till, mm -hmm. which is what all these other coins have done. And then they set themselves up for fins and issues with, with money transmission, which is how Ripple got that. And then they're facing the SEC again over money laundering and over securities regulation. <coughs> it's on and on and on. And and in and, and, and reality, if Monero gets rid of this blockchain surveillance issue, it, it will shoot in the middle of all this. Because all this going after you eliminate all the other tokens. I haven't asked you in a while. We haven't talked about, you know. You, typically, we always talk about like Monero's transaction count and scalability mm -hmm. and dynamic block size. Um, have, what do you think of Monero's transaction count these days? Have you been? I'm sure you've been keeping an eye on things. What's it's your... been flat uh, for a long time. Um, we've kind of had a big trend up, and then it's been in a flat time. Uh, we haven't really moved a lot in transaction count. Uh, of course, there's a major improvements in in the in the algorithms. I, I really am at the point right now where I can say the scaling algorithms are good enough. Uh, I mean, I am proposing some changes and some tweaks that we can do, but we pretty much got, got the scaling aspect pretty much really tight. The things you can do, the members of the community are a bit concerned about, the, the, they want to see sort of a long range dynamic cap, which can be done. Um, and that will make them happier. Some people are still saying, well, you know, the numbers can be tweaked in this and that way. So I think there's some room for compromise in that. Oh, but fundamentally... Putting a cap on the on the on the on the block size. Well, the, the 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 problem with this also is that you get a lot of negativity coming in from Bitcoin, because Bitcoin. The reason for the cap in Bitcoin has got nothing to do with technology. It's got everything to do with the fact that you have a security problem, but they don't want to admit it. So what what some people uh, some people are trying to push for hard caps. You could do it dynamically, where you would have a long term a longer term medium that essentially. Uh, tracks Moore's law or Nielsen's law. You could do something like that. Oh, so it's still yeah. dynamically scaled. It's still up. dynamic. It's just that you give it a much longer time frame, and you do it sort of approximately or Moore's law, Nielsen's law. Essentially, a, a thousand block median is what it would be, which doubles every two years. What were the discussions like in the in the early days when dynamic block size was first uh, considered for Monero? Well, Monero had dynamic box size right from the get-go. I mean, yeah, it was, was, was it something that was uh, discussed, or I guess not really. Like the, the, well, the, the initial discussion in, in in Monero was, of course, was that that led to the tail emission because you needed that for security. Uh, but uh, the the speed sort of the naysayers, but I, uh, a few of them. But basically, Monero had a, it was part of crypto. Now. Yeah, so the, uh, the first crypto node implementation had dynamic block size, but it didn't yes, have without a tail, tail emission, tail which emission. is totally unstable, which is totally unreliable. Right. So, so what were the, yeah. yeah, what were those? Were there conversations? What were those conversations like in the early days? Well, in the early days, the conversations were to create the tail emission. That's why the tail emission was created, mm -hmm. because that was the big change from from um bitcoin to monero right but i guess what what was the debate that took place like in terms of you know should we do this should we do that we need a tail mission maybe it should be this well time. it was done by the original that was before my time uh it was done by the original call team and i think they just basically agreed on it i was one of the condition wasn't implemented and then it was implemented uh in bitcoin talk as a statement in the in the in the thread and then that was uh, coded into the code. I insisted that it be coded in the code to reflect what was put in the uh, 
um, in the Bitcoin top thread. But it wasn't, uh, uh, but that was part of Monero. Certainly since I've been involved because it was something I was putting right at the very beginning before I was oh. even involved. Who is proposing it in the Bitcoin talk thread? Do you remember? Do you, do you remember? No, no, no. In the Bitcoin talk thread, what was put in there was the tail emission itself. It wasn't coded initially. It was put in the announcement thread that we would have a tail emission less than 1%. Ah. Okay. That was put in it. So you create the social covenant. That's where the social covenant was first put in. And then what was done a few months later was coded. But that was in place right from the launch of, after Bit Monero, and from the launch of Monero. And at that time when uh, tail emission was first added to Monero, was dynamic block size adjustments also made to dynamic block size? No, no. The, 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 the main changes to the dynamic block size occurred after confidential transactions because basically all of a sudden your transaction fees sizes go from 400 bytes to 13.5 kilobytes. So you have to do stuff with the block size. And so what we did at that point in time is we increased the um, the base from about, I think, it was 60,000 bytes, the minimum amount to 300,000 bytes. And then after the second major change occurred after we went to, we kept the, the when we went to, um, now being 2000, uh, in 2019, when we went to, um, <clears throat> uh, oh, let me see. So we went from uh, the bulletproofs. Mm. And that dropped the transaction sizes down from 13 kilobytes to about three or 2.8 something like that. Mm -hmm. And at that point in time, there was a lot of concern that the fees were too low. And that's when we introduced the long-term median. And then very much to its credit, right before the start of COVID, COI raised the whole question of fee stability. And that's when we had to make the dynamic the, the minimum, the penalty free zone also dynamic, which is the big improvement that was recently added. With the adoption of Seraphis, do you anticipate there might have to be another adjustment then made to, to the not to the not not with there may be one at the same time as Seraphis, but not because of Seraphis, because Perfect. Seraphis transactions are going to be comparable in size to the below the 3000 byte reference transaction size. So implementing Seraphis, at least with the numbers that people are talking about, which is 128 or even 256, does not require any changes to the dynamic block size algorithm. If you go above that, then it's not a difficult change, but you basically have to change the minimum penalty free zone and adjust some of the medians in the transition phase. But that's about it. But we, uh, you have to deal with it. That's what I'm saying. You don't. But body anarchist has been making the point that it's, and correct correct me or him if he's wrong. That uh, it's 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 likely that Monero uh, transactions are less likely to be, to be faked because there's uh, you know miners don't get as rewarded for you know if they were to spam on on Monero versus Thank other. You. Body Anarchist is talking about a very serious problem with Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And that is that you, if you write out the, if I believe this is correct, there's an attack on Bitcoin where if you just, where it's advantageous for miners to simply stuff the block sizes mm -hmm. in order to cause a feast to That does not work in my opinion. But the reason, that's the reason why it happens a Bitcoin, it doesn't work in my and so when you look at, you know, other cryptos, even like, like Doge, because I know you're always mentioning, you, Do, I think Doge you follow, has you the follow Doge pretty closely. So do you think Doge is, there's a lot of artificial uh, transactions that are taking place there? Well, they haven't hit the limit. In the, see, the other problem with, with, with uh, is, and you get into this problem also with Bitcoin and Sweet, but the Bitcoin and Sweet is quite dramatic, is that if you don't have, <clears throat> sorry, if you don't have a, a pricing to increase the block size, then you have essentially a potential for all sorts of spam attacks. That's what happened in Zcash. I mean, the, their pricing was so low that they just spammed the thing to 50% of the block size mm -hmm. with a single huge uh, set transaction. And there's nothing they could do for like six months until the spammer just gave up. But the problem is, it, 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 the problem has to do with, with fixed block size coins is you have no cost to increase the block size, all of a sudden you hit this hard limit. 
And in Monero, you have a gradual pricing. So all of them have a problem. The difference about Doge is if you wanted to, to retrofit Monero scaling onto Doge, you could do it very easily. You can't do it in Bitcoin or you can't do it in Litecoin because you expose the fundamental problem of the falling block. That's the difference. Mm -hmm. But you could take the code for Monero scaling and adapt it to Doge fairly easily. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. But I'm saying, given that they don't currently have it, are, are we seeing more spam in a in a? Network? Oh, sure, yeah. you're going to see way more spam in, in any coin that's got a flat block size like that because there's no cost to increase the block size. Mm -hmm. There's no pricing in it. So, yeah, you, you, you try to control it with node relay fees and so on, but you're going to see spam attacks. It's easy to spam a coin like that. That's why you had a single, even Bitcoin, you had a single ordinal that was four megabytes or something on Bitcoin blockchain. So what are you going to do that anymore? You might be able to get, a, get away with eight kilobytes or something that people are doing, but not four megabytes. And yes, people are going to want, and more members of the community are going to want to restrict the uh, the uh, uh, TX extra fees. And I think that's one of those things where the, there may be a consensus where you restrict it to the point that you get consensus. Mm -hmm. Arctic, what I would support. Yeah, we we covered a lot. This is awesome. Um, yeah. I got I got all the information I was looking for. I'm, I'm glad we kind of zeroed in and focused on these these specific topics, uh, specifically the blockchain surveillance, uh, whether whether or not. Bitcoin is actually fungible and whether or not blockchain surveillance long-term is an issue. Uh, that, that was a great discussion. Yes. Very is there anything topic. you want to leave the audience with before we close it out for today? Well, right now, I guess I'm looking for what's going to happen legally in the United States. And that's something I think it needs to be watched. Okay. That's a big one. Um, because I well, think, like, that's like gonna, you said, it, that's that's going to come on the judicial arm, not not so yeah, much on the legal. judicial arm. Yeah, because I think that's where the where the where the, and and where the fight really is going to happen. And if there is a breakthrough on the judicial side, then the rest of this other stuff is going to fall into place. Um, so that's what I would be looking at right now. Uh, in the European Union, I would be looking at the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, it's quite likely that there could be a challenge there also if. Uh, following there also, so that's the kind of things. That, oh, and by the way, that would could also impact the United Kingdom. But I think it's gonna it's gonna be more on the judicial side at this point than on the legislative side. And but it's a and it's a huge issue going on with securities law right now, mm -hmm. and and the crackdown in the United States. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, any recommendations of people I could potentially talk to uh, in that regard with uh, you know how things may play out in the US how uh, in terms of well, I, I, traditional I think, government getting involved in effect, effectuating new laws I think making people aware of the problem of blockchain surveillance would be very useful at all levels I think it would be very useful for, for people members of Congress to understand Mm -hmm. the real issues behind it and the risks behind it. Uh, no, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, meant resources or people to talk to that could give us further insight into the direction you think things are going. Just curious if you had any... Uh, oh, any I don't insight. know. I, 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 it'd be hard to say. Uh, I mean, I think it's very interesting to watch this legal case the, uh, uh, to see what's happening there. That's going to be a very interesting problem. Uh, case to work. Who's who's involved in the Monero policy group? I know. I know. Um, well, there's uh, Robin Redwick. Uh, there's uh, actually, if you go there, there's uh, SGP uh, Justin Einhofer. Mm -hmm. There's quite a few other people in there too that that, 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 go, that are involved. Yeah, I'm wondering if there's anybody from that group that I haven't really spoken to. Uh, well, I, I don't know. At one point. Yeah, I mean, you just go on to the um, one the policy group. It's got all the names in the um, in the submissions that we made. Okay. Oh, uh, the other one's binary fate. He's also involved in it too. Oh, binary is involved in it too. Okay. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. He he was involved in a lot of them. Uh yeah. Hopefully, some of those guys will be at. Ages is another one. Yeah, they will be organizing one One of the organizers is involved yeah. in that too. Yeah, they're they're quite involved because a lot of Europeans are involved in that. So yeah, a lot of those guys could be a Monero cost. So you definitely want to talk to them about it. Um, I mean, well, it's actually a panel at Monero Con. 
Mm -hmm. who is going to be on the policy group. I'm on it, actually. Yeah. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, so Uh, I will give you a good source of uh, people to interview other than myself. Fantastic. Arctic, thank you so much. I guess that that, that closes out. I'll I'll, I'll see you soon. I'll see you at MoneroCon. We'll be having you. You bet. Yeah, so that'd be, yeah, we'll be meeting in Prague. All right. Arctic, thank you so much. Uh, If you do find time, feel free to hit me up as you you pass through New York. Maybe we could. uh, Yeah, I'm flying out to New York tomorrow. Buy you a beer or something. Hit me up. Yeah, so we can find out and and meet together. Uh, Please let me know. I think it's. You know, I gotta find out that I got time that I'm not involved on the on the on the court case. That's basically what it is. Oh yeah, yeah. If you have a moment, let me know. We could we could yes, yes, we can try to come to you. Just take you out for dinner or something. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I can sort of uh, maybe just send you an email through. uh, Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. I can let you know through that. Yeah, send us up with an email. I'll send send you all this information. We can do that. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. All right, thanks. Well, thank you. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to our show on YouTube, Odyssey, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Go to MoneroTalk.live to subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we are always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.